<laughs> Thank you, Ryan. Um, good afternoon, everybody. So what we're going to do today is um, talk about a little bit about the the principles of unit costing and why it's important. Go through some tips on how to set up MYOB and then look at how we can use Calxa to get you some unit costs on a on a regular basis so that they're practical and usable um, and what we're not going to show you is a 32-page spreadsheet, I guess is, is the short, short part of that. Um, so uh, um, type questions in your question, question box on the control panel and Ryan's going to ask me those as we go through. So happy to answer your questions and clarify anything that's not clear as we go through. So um, what does Calxa do? Essentially, we've got budgeting and reporting software, and we integrate with the main accounting applications that are used. Um, so, do a lot with MYB, you do a little bit with Reckon or QuickBooks, and a little bit with Xero. Now, why is, why is unit costing important? It's, it's fashionable, <laughs> it's fashionable in a number of sectors at the moment. Probably one of the main ones is the disability sector with the advent of the um, NDIS, but it's also affecting um, aged care. Um, I'm not sure what states you're all in, but um, in New South Wales, I know the health department there is asking for unit costs as part of their tendering process. So there's a number of different reasons why um, there's this push towards getting and managing using unit costs. And I guess the the reason behind it essentially comes down to your organization being sustainable. Has it got the ability to keep going? And you know, in the disability sector there, for example, with the NDIS, where we have that transition from block funding to um, funding in the hands of the, the client, the person with disabilities, there's a question of, are we price, can, can we afford to sell our services for the price that has been set for them and be sustainable in the long term? So pr pricing is important, and I'll I'll probably talk more and use more examples on the NDAS side of things because that's the area that I'm probably most familiar with. But the the, the basic principles are the same whether you're in disability or aged care or or health or your you're just thinking that you know this is the the coming trend, and it's it's something that's spreading throughout the not-for-profit sector. So, pricing of of services and activities is something that um, most not-for-profits haven't had to worry about too much in the past. Um, you know, depending a little bit on the areas that you're working in, but with, for example, the the NDIS. At least in the initial stages, prices are set by the NDIA, and and so because the prices are set, so you know if you're told that you can, when you provide a carer to someone, you're going to get forty-two dollars an hour for that. You have to understand what the cost of providing that carer is, and ideally, it'll be less than forty-two dollars an hour, so you can actually make some money on it, not. Um, not lose money on providing the service. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as a principle later on. So this is mostly about management accounting. It's about getting the information 
so you can run the organization in a better way through these changing times so that you you know where you're making money where you might be losing money you can manage your funds and and basically ensure your survival so for for many organizations it's it's quite pressing and i probably don't don't need to be telling you this i mean you're obviously the people who think this is important that's why you've turned up to the webinar today but you know talking to people about the transition to the NDIS um, those in trial areas those in launch sites and finally we get one up in Townsville next next month um, it's the people that have prepared in advance that have their systems in place that understand the impact of the change that are best prepared for it so the ones who started thinking you know you know I dealt with one organization recently in um, in New South Wales and they actually started um, working on some individualized funding for their for their clients themselves um, probably four or five years ago and and started costing their services at that time and and for them there's nothing scary about moving to the NDAS they understand how the system works their people are at least prepared for the general concepts so getting an understanding of the costs of those services is something you want to do before the NDIS hits you or whatever changes are happening in aged care or whichever sector you're working in don't don't wait till the day after the launch and say okay we better start costing our services now it's it's something that it's going to want some changes to your systems. It's going to want some changes. It's changes to your thinking as much as anything. Now, one of the important things I think about unit costing that I think has been missed in a lot of the, for want of a better word, official advice. Um, is that it's something you need to do over and over again it's it's no good to just measure the cost of your services today and then not look at them again and when I first looked at some of the spreadsheets that are floating around in this area um, you know there's ADDOC in New South Wales have got one, QUT have done one, I think Curtin University have done one. There's probably a, a handful of them around that um, the likes of Pricewaterhouse and KPMG have probably got paid thousands of dollars to create. But I looked at those spreadsheets and you know the 15, 20 pages of figures to fill out. That's fine in terms of getting a one-off cost of your activity and and yes you can be very accurate down to the last cent but it's a huge effort to actually do that whereas costs will change over time and and I think it's really important to actually monitor those changes over time um, to to understand that you know just because the service cost you $35 to um, provide last month doesn't necessarily it's, I mean it's still going to cost $35 in a month's time or six months time so I think it's something that needs to be repeated it's something you need to monitor trends over time and one of the other things that will affect um, the cost of services is the level of activity 
for example, if you're um, providing, um, say, a physiotherapy service and you're providing that for 20 clients, the cost per hour of providing that service is likely to be different whether it's 20 clients or 50 clients, you know, because there will be some economies of scale in terms of equipment, in terms of um, the other services that go around the, the labour of the actual service. So as your activity level fluctuates, goes up, goes down, you provide more of a service or less of a service, then the cost per activity is going to vary. So, so that's why I think it's it's important to to monitor these costs on an ongoing basis, so that each month you're looking at those costs and and seeing that they're still below the prices that you're you're getting for them. Because if not, the simple outcome. sustainable and closes down and the service doesn't get provided at all. So it's about having that information and one of the things that we've really tried to do at Calxa is to make it easy to get that information month after month so you can compare one month to another so you can see trends, that sort of thing. It's important that your board is aware of the costs of the services that you're providing, that somebody in that board is taking an interest in, in the long-term sustainability of your organisation. Um, ideally, all your board members are doing that, um, but you know, as, as we know, on not-for-profit boards, some some are more financially literate than others, some have a better idea, a better understanding of finance than others and and like those of us in in the finance area itself, board members too need to need to change their thinking about um, how how the organization's operating. In, in this changing world. And one of, the, one of the key changes that needs to happen is that, um, and I guess I'm talking particularly of dis the disability area, but I think, I think generally um, the world is coming around to the, the idea that it's okay for not-for-profit organisations to make a profit. In fact, it makes sense for them to make a profit and to build up reserves. You know, I um, NCOS, the New South Wales Council of Social Services, released a state of the sector report earlier this year, where something like only only 40% of not-for-profits that they surveyed had more than three months of cash reserves. So when when you're in a, a block-funded situation where you have a contract that says you're going to get $50 million twice a year on a specific date, that's not such a big issue. But where you're effectively in a marketplace where you're competing with other service providers, your income is much less predictable and you may have, you know, you'll have commitments to expenditure, so it becomes much more a, a business-like type of environment where, you know, you've got to basically sell your services in order to Firstly, cover your costs, but then 
generate some sort of a profit so that you've got those reserves so that in the event of a, a slow month or a slow couple of months or you know some some new competitor comes into town you know Booper or Woolworths decide that they 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 can offer the same service as you at a at a cheaper price and with a bigger marketing budget you know it may take you time to adjust what you're doing and having those reserves gives you that buffer that time to adjust without having to panic basically now I talked about we need to make a profit and we need to understand the costs of the service because the price of the service that you get for the service should be greater than the cost. There may be times where you're providing f services that you don't get funding for or that the price you get for it doesn't cover the cost and you might decide that you're going to provide that service regardless because it's it's a core part of who you are as an organization to provide that service and you know whether some government body recognizes that or not this is what we do as an organization it's part of our identity therefore we're going to do it and and I think that's fine um, but I think you still need to understand the costs of those services so that you can then think about what profits are we making in other areas of the organization that are going to cover this shortfall in this area so another reason why you want to have some profitable services that will cover those other less profitable ones that you still want to provide or sometimes the unprofitable ones that you want to provide but you just got to make sure that you don't provide a whole series of unprofitable ones because there's a limit to how long you can do that and even in the world of the NDIS and all the change there there's there's still going to be some block funding and and I think the NDIA recognizes that um, and and even in the disability sector lots of organizations will have alternate sources of funding you know quite often organizations in disability don't just do disability they do you know they might do a little bit of aged care or some community transport stuff that's outside of that and so so there's there'll be some funding um, some block funding still for that reason there'll be some because depending on where you are especially in regional areas that there is no market for um, no efficient market for your services because it's t too small to regional or whatever and I think um, there'll still be block funding for particular services in particular areas so let's that's enough of the theory for now <laughs> um, as I said um, if you have questions feel free to ask them and I'll do my best to answer them but what I want to turn to now is the practical steps of how we actually get these unit costs without spending hours and days every week every month working on them well, Mick, we don't have and any questions just yet, so maybe we'll just launch into the demo and see if that shakes some questions loose. <laughs> okay, okay, let's 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 see if we can do that. Don't be shy. So the first thing we need to do 
is get rid of your spreadsheet. Um, I know there's some big complicated spreadsheets out there for doing unit costing, but I'm an accountant and I get I, I I get I get confused by some of them. So let's let's move on from spreadsheets and look at what we need to do. And I guess the first thing you need to do is is work out what activities you need to understand the costs for. So what what's the activity that you're um, you're providing? So it could be an hour of a speech therapist or it could be taking a group of people on an outing. It could be providing a, a home for some people with disabilities, that sort of thing. So and and everybody will have, you know, their own their own, their own different range of, of activities they need to understand the costs for. And I think one of the well, one of the key questions when you're trying to work out, you know, what it, what activities do you need to cost, and is you know what's your client paying for? If the client is paying for a physiotherapist for a day or a a carer for a week, then that's probably your activity. How detailed you go with that is is I think uh, it's a it's a cost benefit analysis. You know you don't need to you don't need to treat each individual instance of spending two, doing two hours of speech therapy as an activity and work out whether you've made a profit on that. But you do want to look at the whole of the speech therapy that the services that you provided for a month, say, and did we make a profit on that? What were the costs of it? And then from that, what's the average cost per hour? Um, compare that to the um, price that we're getting. Sometimes it can be more complex than that. You know, there isn't a direct relationship between one client, one service. And when I, I know when I first got asked to help out with some NDIS trial sites, everybody was saying you need to treat each client as as a cost center basically and and work out the cost per client. I don't think that's necessarily the case. I think sometimes that makes sense. You know, if you're in the business of, of providing home care, for example, and and that's the core of what you do and you're providing a carer to each individual client Treating the client as the cost center may make sense. Other examples, um, I did some work for a, a respite organization who take groups of people with disabilities out for Saturday afternoon outings. And the numbers will vary. And the numbers will vary even more um, once people have choice about where they spend their money, whether they're going to turn up for your outing or go off and do something else. So, you know, sometimes they take them to the to the zoo and then a pizza or they might go to the movies and have Chinese takeaway on the beach or something. But so the activities would vary, the number of people involved would vary, and because of that the number of carers would vary as well. So it didn't make sense in that case to try and calculate a cost per um, participant in detail. So, so what we did was treat that activity 
of Saturday afternoon outings as our cost centre, calculated the total costs of that for the month and then divided that by the number of people participating to get a cost per participant which we then compared to what they would pay. And, and then you can start looking at what are your break-even numbers. You know, so if we get six people on the outing, then we cover our costs. If we get 10 people, we make a profit. If we only get three, we make a loss. And, and if you only get three once or once every six months, it's not a big deal because the profit that you make on the other weeks will cover that. So it's about being realistic about what's what's important, what's what's worth worrying about, what's too much detail. So it wants a bit of thinking and that's and that's something that only you can do, you know, with an understanding of your organization. But hopefully that gives you some pointers in that direction. And then I'm I'm going to talk about MYOB today. If you're using Reckon slash QuickBooks or you're using Zero or something else, the basic principles of what I say for um, will will apply just the same to MYOB. But um, most of the organisations I come across in the not-for-profit sector are are using MYOB and 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 for good reasons. So I, I guess there's two two main areas of of, of possible concern with MYOB. One is how your chart of accounts is set up, and secondly, how your um, what you're using for your cost centres. Are you using jobs or categories, or um, worse still, using your chart of accounts to track your cost centres, and If there is anybody out there using the chart of accounts to track cost centres, I, I, I would advise you to change sooner rather than later. Um, that's 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 my 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 one bit of prejudice that I'm going to come up with today. Um, I, I understand that. People who've been using just MYOB to do their reporting, um, there are limitations to what you can do with jobs and categories in terms of reporting. But I'm going to show you with Calxa how you can get around those. But it's much more difficult to get around a chart of accounts where you basically have Department A and a list of accounts, Department B and the same list of accounts, and then Department C and the same list of accounts. That makes it really hard for any sort of external reporting. Um, if you're in that situation and you want some transitional help, um, contact me and I'll be happy to talk about how you can, you know, because it is difficult to change that situation midway through the year, but I was talking to someone in Sydney just the other week who did have a setup like that. and. And, and we came up with a with a plan B that was going to get her through to the end of the financial year, and then she was going to move to using jobs in MYOB then. And so, as long as you don't have your cost centres in the chart of accounts, I'm reasonably happy with any chart of accounts set up. Um, if you'd asked me ten years ago, I would have said the chart of accounts should be set up to give you the best management reporting um, because that's what you use to run the business. But with Calxa now, you can actually rearrange that chart of accounts within Calxa without affecting what happens in MYOB. So my, my current opinion is that the chart of accounts should be set up to make it as easy as possible for the person doing the data entry. So 
if you're the bookkeeper and you like your expenses in a nice alphabetical list, go for it. I don't care because when it comes to management reporting, we'll just rearrange them to suit the different needs of the different audiences for the management reports. Then, do you use jobs or categories? My general preference is to use jobs and that's mainly because they're, they're much more flexible and you can have a hierarchy of jobs. So you can have jobs with sub jobs under them and sub jobs under those, which means that you can group them and summarize them when it comes to reporting. I know you can't do that in MYOB, but you can do it in Calxa. Categories have just a flat structure, so you've just got a, a list with no header categories. And the hard part with categories is that they apply to the whole transaction in MYOB rather than individual lines. So it's hard to split a transaction across two categories without, ent without entering two transactions. It's hard to transfer something from one category to another. The only, the only circumstances where I think it makes sense to use categories, um, and only some sense, well, the, 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 the one where you have to use categories is where you def definitely have to have a balance sheet per category, per, per cost center. If you need a balance sheet per cost center, then categories will give you that within MYOB, jobs won't. Um, other than that, you can work with categories if you've got fairly distinct cost centers with no transactions between them and no shared transactions. But, but for most circumstances, jobs are much more flexible. You can put multiple jobs on a, on a single transaction. You can allocate a person's wages to multiple jobs. Um, and and you can have that hierarchy. So I, my, my recommendation is you use jobs. Um, if you're already using categories and the data entry side of it's not too hard for you, then carry on using them because um, you can you'll get most of the same reporting out of out of Calxa whether you're using jobs or categories. You just don't quite the same flexibility in terms of grouping them. Then the question of do you use the, the old classic MYOB or the new account rights? Well, we're up to 2015. Um, in most cases, I think most people will find benefits from moving to the new one. Um, There were problems a few years ago in terms of speed and performance. Um, I don't hear too many of those stories these days, um, very rarely, but there's a number of features and particularly bank feeds that will make a difference to the automation of some of your processes, making the bank reconciliation easier, um, getting transactions into the file easier. So. Um, definitely worth having a look at. Um, whether you have the file online or locally on your desktop is a matter of have you got a reasonable internet? And you know, I've I access my um, my MYOB file that's online on my tethered phone. So it doesn't require, you know, it doesn't require an MBN connection. Um, I have one here in the office, but um, I don't don't have to have that in order to run MYOB online. But you know, I've realised that's not the case everywhere, especially in some remote areas. And remote, I know, is sometimes the Adelaide Hills. Um, so. If you've got decent internet, I think it's certainly worth trying it online. 
it gives you the ability to share it with other people who are off-site, it gives you the ability to um, share it with any external help, you know, if you've got an MYB consultant working with you or an external accountant, then they can access that data much more easily. So, um, and talking of MYB consultants, um, they're the best people to to help you if you if you need help. There's MYB have on their website, as I'm probably don't need to tell you, but on their website you'll find a list of MYB certified consultants in your area, and you'll probably find quite a few of those you know their way around calcs as well. So let me talk a little bit about calcs how it works. I'll give you the outline and then would gi I'll give you the quick five minute tour of the software. Hey Mick, before we so, do that, do you mind answering a couple yeah. of quick questions? I can answer a couple of quick questions. Awesome. Um, so the first one is that Sandy wants to know whether you can supply any sample chart of accounts, jobs or categories for this system? Oh, um, I'm, I'm not sure, I could, but I'm not sure how valuable they would be. Um, you know, um, a couple of years ago there were government agencies running up and down the country telling everybody they need to use the standard chart of accounts for not-for-profit organisations. Um, and there are still some, some, some government departments here and there requiring that or advising it, but um, I see much less noise in that area these days. Um, so, and and it's and it's a fairly big, long, cumbersome chart of accounts. So I probably wouldn't recommend that. I I think it, chart of accounts wants sitting down and and working out what information you need to get in there and what information you want to get out. So, you know, what expense lines do you need? what income lines do you need and and you know that may be something to sit with a with an MYB consultant and and get some advice on there um, if you if you want some recommendations I'll um, give you my email address at the end of the session somewhere and you can shoot me an email and tell me what part of the country you're in and I'll I've I've been around the MYB world for a while, so I've I've got a I've got a reasonable idea of who who's 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 good and who's not so good. But um, you know, they all go through a a certification process. So I think you know the actual detail of the chart of accounts and um, wants to wants to be fairly individual to you, and and then the list of jobs comes down to what activities do you need to track and you know so so it's looking at those different services that you provide and and looking at the the activities that you're selling and and construct a list of jobs around that um, to get, so that you get the right management information I hope that helps um, but if you want if you want to discuss that in more detail, happy to take that one offline um, and go into more detail offline. How's that? Yeah, that sounds great. Um, okay, a couple of observations here. Uh, Karen has said that she advocates moving to the standard chart of accounts from QUT um, mm -hmm. and endorsed yep. by the Australian government. Um, some, and some as I said, you know that that will work. Um, I, I think. I, I think it works as long as you go through, go through and clean out all the stuff that you don't want. You know, because yeah, it's a, it's a big long list that's standard, and and I, I think it does work. But yeah, it just wants cleaning out of the stuff that you don't want, so you don't get confused when you're doing your data entry. Excellent. Um, another observation here. This is a really good one, actually, Mick. Somebody reckons that you're completely right and that MYOB 2015 is the way to go. It's so much better than a couple of years ago. It's from Pam. Oh. I never doubted you at all, oh. mate. 
<laughs> well, me completely right. Okay, that's good. <laughs> I agree. I agree too. I have to agree with that one. <laughs> um, does Kalksa, or you, you might, I might be uh, spoiling the surprise for the next section, but does Kalksa allow for the bulk upload of claims into the NDIS portal? No, no. Um, Kalksa's um, working on the on the back end management reporting side of things, of of looking at the costs that you've recorded in MYOB and then getting the getting the costs there after the event. Um, if you're looking for something to upload claims to the um, NDIA portal, you you probably want some sort of case management system. Um, there's there's a few of them around. I know Info Exchange um, have one that I think is called SRS, um, which I've heard good things about, but I haven't actually seen it. And so n that's that side isn't my area of expertise, but um, certainly have a look at what Info Exchange have got and see if that looks useful to you. Because I believe that's either feeds data into MYOB or is or is going to very soon. Yeah, I, I don't know myself actually. So um, uh, the info exchange details are on our website on the suppliers directory um, and you can give those guys a call and they're always very happy to talk to you. Um, I've got one here. Uh, to get, this is from Trevor, to get accurate unit costings, would I need to have jobs for one-to-one -one GRP case coordination? And if that's the case, would I need to break out all associated costs, e.g. wages and program costs? So, um, so it's one to, what was after one-to-one? -one? GRP and yeah. case coordination. Um, I, I, th I think there's there's a a point at which you need to you need to make a decision about how detailed your costings need to be, um, and you can you can spend a lot of time and effort allocating every tiny little cost to um, particular activities but I think you need to and and it's sometimes it takes a bit of time to work this out but which I think is one, one of the reasons for you know the earlier you start on this stuff the better um, I think it's it's important to think about the cost of actually collecting the information and comparing that to the the value and usefulness of the information you know if if i can work out quickly that my activity cost me 10 dollars per participant or i can do two days of work and work out that it cost me 10 dollars and 15 cents I'm better off with the first quick, reasonably accurate costing that doesn't take me a huge amount of time to get it. So you, I think it's it's you know in in most cases because we're dealing with a service-based industry. Most of our costs revolve around wages, and so it's someone's time plus the on costs associated with that, and then possibly some sort of equipment, and and then you might do an overhead allocation at the end of the month and and divide that over your different um, jobs. So I, I I know it's not a <laughs> I know it's not a simple, straightforward answer to your question, um, and I'm, I'm not qualified to answer exactly your question because 
I don't know exactly your setup and and what would make sense in your circumstances, but I think general guideline is how can you get a a reasonably accurate estimate of the cost of providing each service and you know that may be that you know in in the example I gave of the um, you know the sad day outings we said a sad day outing is an activity we count how many sad day outings we do in a month and we allocate all the costs associated with sad day outings to that and we look at that on a monthly basis and divide the total cost over the month by the number of participants and that gives us our unit cost and it didn't matter if you know it was the zoo one week and the movies the next and you know the trip to the beach is really cheap because all we do is buy buy fish and chips and the trip to the zoos more expensive because we've got entry fees and things it's it's the overall cost over the month divided by the number of participants so I think you have to you know there's a trade-off there uh, I hope that answers that one we might um, we might move on now Mick because there's a couple yep. of questions here I reckon you're about to answer so um, we'll okay. move on now and everyone else who's answered a, asked a question will answer those at the end Okay, sounds good. So, MYOB does your compliance reporting, so it, it's great for getting your BAS done, doing your payroll, that sort of thing. CALCSA is about management reporting, it's about the information you need in order to run the organisation. And there's three steps to setting it up. One is linking to your MYOB file. Second is bringing in your existing budgets and if they're in MYOB we can bring them in from there, if they're in a spreadsheet we can import them from there and then automating your reports. And once you've got Calcsa set up, it's a simple process each month of just open it up, update the data from MYOB and run your bundles of reports. So somewhere here, if I can find the right screen, I've got a Calxa and I'll bring it across and we'll give you the, the quick guided tour to how Calxa works. So in organization management, this is where we connect to your MYOB file. So I've got, in this one, I've got some that are the, the new account right 2015, I've got some that are the old Premier 19. Um, once it's in Calxa, process is ex exactly the same. Um, there'll be an update button at the bottom there which brings across the latest data. So I'm going to start with the end result here. And we have let's hope this one works. We have report bundles, which are basically batches of reports that you run um, all at once, and it will just give you that whole list of reports depending on what you've set up and it's opened on the wrong screen so I'll just drag that across. So, so in this particular bundle I've got a chart that's comparing my unit costs to my budget, actuals and budget month by month for the year. I've got a, a report with some sustainability KPIs so I can see how we're doing. You know I've got things like my bank balance month by month and I'm showing actuals for completed months and budget for the rest of the year. Um, this file is actually, I was using it for a New Zealand sample the other day so it's actually on a, 
a, a March year end, but um, it'll pick up the end of year from your MYOB file. I've got a KPI there for cash reserves in days. Um, you know, I, I talked earlier about how um, on, um, something like 40% of New South Wales not-for-profits have got less than three months reserves. That's a, a fairly key statistic that funding providers are looking at to see how sustainable organisations are. So important to build up those reserves and you'll see in this example we're actually reducing ours so we're spending too much money. Um, debtor days, so outstanding debtors, what's the average collection time? Um, number of participants in all our activities, the overall unit cost of our activities. Um, working capital ratio, so a comparison of our um, current assets to our current liabilities. And then I've got an income trends um, chart that's showing me the different um, funding sources for this organisation and where they're coming from and how they're changing over time. So there's a whole range of reports in CALCSA and I'll, I'll show you a handful of them in a moment. But the, the idea is that you put them into a bundle. So you might have one bundle for your board reports, one for the CEO's reports, um, and you know maybe one for your different program managers so that you've got all the report criteria set and you just generate this one bundle and it's still opening on my other screen and and from here you can either turn it into a PDF or email it directly from here or export it to Excel as well so I've just got a range of different charts and reports here I've got a cash flow forecast chart there that's predicting my bank balance month by month over the next 12 months. Um, that's one I've customised with a logo and some fairly ugly colours really. Um, the reforecast one that's showing actuals for each month up to date and then it's recalculating the budget. This is more a grant based one where it's showing what the what you can spend in order to reach your annual budget by the end of the year. Income to date and again you can run any of these reports either at the organisation level or for individual jobs. Let's just go and have a look at some individual reports now rather than the bundle. Um, aware that we're reasonably short on time so I'll just I'll just show you a couple of the reports just to give you an idea of the sort of things you can do so the budget summary report we've got different templates which are basically different column layouts you can select your different jobs so you can select which ones you want and save that to a list if you select a header job, if I just get detail there, you get options of detail consolidated or detail and consolidated. So that's what I meant about the additional flexibility of using jobs. Um, if you're using categories, you don't get those headers, so you can't consolidate at the different levels. Um, if anybody's using Reckon, you can do something similar with classes in, in Reckon accounts. And, and you can select the whole lot and again either show detail consolidated or detail plus consolidated. You can have multiple versions of your budget so, so you can have your approved budget and your current forecast. You can also do scenario planning and I'll show you account trees in a minute um, and then you can put the KPIs on on the report. There's about 15 or so standard KPIs that are there and there's a KPI editor at the top where you can actually create your own and that's reasonably sim simple process. So if we just look at this report just to give you an example 
and uh, so so this one's showing actuals, budget, and variance for the month, year to date, annual total, what's unspent, and the percentages that's been spent, and in this case, I've consolidated all my different projects, but I could have them individually on here as well if I wanted to. And then with the KPIs in this additional information section at the bottom. Again, you can export to PDF or Excel or email directly from here. One quick thing I want to show you there is account trees. These are great for um, those of you who are using standard chart of accounts, for example, um, because one of the things about standard chart of accounts is, especially in the expenses section, it gives you a, a fairly um, flat structure with no, no headings. And what I've done here is I've put in exp expenses here for, sorry, headings here for counselling, operating, admin, finance, marketing, wages. So I've, I've grouped those accounts differently to the way they are in my MYOB file. And basically you create a new header account here and you can just drag your accounts from one section to another and rearrange them, regroup them as you need for particular purposes, particular audiences. So I don't want to go into too much detail about that, but um, Essentially with Calxa, it's a matter of connect to your MYOB file, bring in your budget and either bring it in from MYOB if that's where it is, um, bring it in from a spreadsheet, um, basically export first and that will give you a template to bring it in, copy and paste from your existing spreadsheet onto there and then import it. Or we've got a wizard that will take last year's actuals and create a budget for next year, that sort of thing or then you can manually edit the budget after that. So a um, lot of flexibility in how you can get the budgets in and, and then a whole library of reports here to look at things in, in different ways. So I'm aware that I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to go into too much detail there. And I've got an avalanche of questions for you too, Mick. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> what's the questions? No, no, you finish, finish your presentation. No, <laughs> okay. I was just going to say, um, we, um, Ryan mentioned our donation program briefly at the beginning. Um, we do donations of Calxa to um, small not-for-profits and small generally means turnover of less than a million dollars. There's some category qualification eligibility guidelines there, but that's all on the Connecting Up website. Um, if you don't qualify for the donation, they do discounts for um, people who want to pay us pay money. So, um, <laughs> But talk to Connecting Up and, and they'll help. There's also a free trial if you just want to have a look, see what it's like, see if it works for you. There's a free trial on our website, which is calxa.com. Whether you're on the trial, whether you're on a donation, whether you're on a paid copy, we provide support. We'll help you get up and running, um, give you whatever support you need to get going. So don't be shy about calling us. What's your questions, Ryan? All right, Mick, speed round this time. <laughs> okay, let's go. <laughs> so how would you make a change when your chart of accounts is your cost centre and jobs track the funder? I would I would probably look at setting up um, he header jobs and sub jobs and whether the funder is the header job and the cost centers are the sub jobs or the other way around would depend a little bit on the organization um, but even if the cost centers are under different funders you can group them together to get the information you want within Calxa. So, um, if the person who asks that wants more detail, um, I'll give you my email address at the end, happy to 
go into more detail on that offline. Excellent. Um, okay, do you have to enter overhead calculations in Maya before using Calcsur? You, it's advisable. Okay. It's a, um, you know, you're you're going to get um, you know if you've if you've allocated the the overheads to the individual jobs, then you're going to get a better result. What is your definition of cash reserves? Is that cash on hand, cash equity, or something else? It's generally um, current liabilities or some variation on that. So it's cash on hand um, or on short-term deposits. Um, it could be outstanding debtors. Um, would usually exclude inventory. Okay. Uh, does Calxa integrate with MYOB EXO business? No. Okay. Not at this stage. We've had some requests, but it's not on the current plans. How are you entering the number of participants into MYOB for the Calxa report? At the moment, we have a. There's, there's how we do it now, which is a, a clever little workaround with a journal in the other expenses section. And I've, we've got um, details on our website, but in a couple of months' time, we'll have an area in within Calxa where you enter those that non-financial information like number of participants, number of hours worked, and that sort of thing directly in Calxa for budgets and actuals. Uh... How do you, well, this might almost double up on the last one, how do you enter the number of participants for group activities and on which platform? Um, at the moment you're entering them in MYB. Um, in a couple of months you'll enter them directly in Calxa. Can you group together individual jobs from different projects to one report? You can, certainly can, yes. And how you does... just select them, save them to a list, yep. And how does Calxa determine unit cost? Um, basically through our KPI editor. So, um, and the, the KPI editor, if I show you very quickly, works off groups of accounts. And, and so you have a, an account group. I've got one here for participants. And and I've got another one for total expense and then I have a cost per participant which is basically expenses divided by participants. Awesome. Well that speed round was perfect Nick, we've answered all the questions. Uh, lots of requests for your um, for some um, chart of accounts and things so we'll organise to get yep. that sent out at the end with the recording and the slides. Uh, thank you everybody for attending, thanks Mick for being so generous with your time and your donated product um, and uh, we will be in touch with everyone shortly.